Hello everyone, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, all of you to David who has come all the way from Denmark. Uh, he is from Chaos Pilot and I will talk in a bit about what Chaos Pilot is. Uh, David just concluded a three-day masterclass with us on the art and craft of designing learning spaces and that's what he's going to be talking about a little bit today as well. Uh, but to say a little bit more about David, he is a learning designer by profession. Uh, he is somebody who works on process leadership and designing frameworks in education. Uh, along with that, he is also an entrepreneur with his own enterprise, working with large organizations and startups alike. And he is also a Chaos Pilot alumni. Um, so Chaos Pilot is this design and leadership school in Denmark with more than 25 years of experience behind it and that has sort of also shaped uh, David's understanding of how learning processes need to be designed um, and, and their pedagogy is rooted in the four E's of experimentation, uh, exploration, an enterprising approach and experiential education and we are going to hear about all of that and more from David today. So welcome David. pleasure doing uh, the master class with you and your colleagues and other people from around India. So uh, I've been a student at the Chaos Pilots and graduated three years ago and it's a three-year uh, intense uh, program where you study together uh, mm -hmm. a group of international students and um, it's worth mentioning that it's team-based so we were a group of 38 students studying together, uh, mm -hmm. working on projects, experimenting with different styles of leadership, and uh, trying ourselves out in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So you're not only learning from the, the teachers, you could say, but also learning from your peers and mm -hmm. creating that whole learning culture mm -hmm. around this uh, school and community, because it is really a learning community um, where there are no, like, professors or teachers hired at the school, mm -hmm. but only like a core team of uh, what we call team leaders that set the learning and design the learning experience for the students at the Chaos Pilots. Mm -hmm. And then we bring in external faculty of uh, uh, people from the field of academia and uh, like uh, thought leaders and uh, business leaders from around the world to teach us and work with us in a collaborative format. Mm -hmm. And then we're out applying these things, testing out our new competencies in different environments around the globe. Wow, that sounds really interesting and very different from the conventional way of how learning happens in institutions. Well, you should come and go. <laughs> totally on my list to do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if I were to ask you that what are some of the key aspects that go into designing a learning experience or a learning process, uh, also given your experience at Chaos Pilot, what would some of those aspects be? Yes. And I believe the first question to ask yourself when designing a learning experience is how do you perceive yourself? Mm -hmm. Like, Do you see yourself as being a learning designer? And if you don't, then get into that role. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of teachers uh, are trained within a certain profession, like they're math mathematicians or they are language professionals and they really burn and have passion for, for this field. And they want to bring that forward to some uh, mm -hmm. young students. Um, mm -hmm. And in order to succeed with that mm -hmm. promise for bringing that piece of knowledge forward, they need to create a learning environment where that can happen. Mm -hmm. And if you want to succeed with that, you also need to see yourself as a learning designer and as a facilitator of learning spaces mm -hmm. to create the right foundation and frames for these young students to actually learn. Mm -hmm. So there are several parts to that and the first part is of course then designing that learning experience and the second part is delivering that learning experience and facilitating that. And to design that learning experience, uh, a lot of the times what I see teachers do is uh, they're also often limited on time. So sitting and finding, oh there's something we can use there, trying to grab things in and then mm -hmm. adapt that in the, in the classroom. But in order to really succeed with actually delivering this, uh, living up to this promise, uh, there's an idea of moving to the core vision you have for uh, the learning space you're creating and your vision for the future of these students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really work vision based and say what do I want to uh, achieve with these students and what uh, way do I perceive life and mm -hmm. 
what do I want them to, mm -hmm. uh, to go for? Mm -hmm. And based on this uh, vision, actually start building then what kind of students would we like to uh, support? So what profile would we like to give them? Mm -hmm. And have a look at our local community. What are, we, what mm -hmm. are the community asking for? Mm -hmm. And also what are, what are the industry or workplaces uh, in India in this uh, case asking for? Mm -hmm. um, and then see, can we actually create a profile uh, for these students that supports societal needs or societal needs for for change or for jobs or mm -hmm. whatever and then um, in connection to that then go backwards and design the learning experience mm -hmm. so in the three-day master class that you have also just taken part of um, mm -hmm. we work with uh, a framework developed by the chaos pilots called the vision backcasting uh, framework mm -hmm. and the idea is to work uh, identify this core vision of what you really want to do and then based on that identify mm -hmm. the key uh, pieces of knowledge skills and attitudes mm -hmm. and i would like to dig a bit deeper into that um, sure. because a lot of uh, education has for many many years favorites the piece of knowledge that mm -hmm. there are some certain things that we need to know and uh, a lot of assessment systems have also favored that we need to, like, uh, when did the Second World War start? Uh, More fact-based yeah, and fa information fact based. Based. Fact and information. Mm -hmm. And the amount of information in, in the world is changing so rapidly. So that role is still important in the field of education to learn how to get knowledge uh, mm -hmm. and also to get some basic understanding of math, language, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. But it can't stand alone now this piece yes. of like the knowledge part and then there's the skill part mm -hmm. which is about applying the knowledge you then have and putting that into context so you could call it the the doing mm -hmm. um, and the way of acting on the knowledge you have and the experience you get mm -hmm. and then there's this uh, part of attitudes which could you could call it the the being mm -hmm. or the mindset towards what you do and here we work with the idea of learning to learn mm -hmm. and looking at how do you perceive life, how do you interact with others. Mm -hmm. So the thing about like activating curiosity, being empathic towards others and all these things. So mm -hmm. in order to actually apply and deliver uh, the knowledge you have and turn it into uh, actual value for other people. There's also a whole thing around that and the way you, you communicate and interact with other people and the way you perceive the work you do and are aware that the, the world is changing and you need to adapt mm -hmm. to that. So identifying these three elements and then afterwards, like going backwards, how could we then set a structure mm -hmm. to these elements? So if we, if we identified that mm -hmm. this is the core piece of knowledge, skills mm -hmm. and attitudes we would like to bring to our, our students, how can we then set a structure to a program that fits their needs? Mm -hmm. And an uh, important part of this framework is also looking at who are the students that we are getting in or potential students, uh, because we can't just make a uh, <coughs> program that's relevant for everybody. We need mm -hmm. to adapt the learning to mm. the learners. Yes. So figure out who are those students coming into our school or if we already have an existing program, mm. who are the profile they have, like what, what, what are they capable of when they come in? What do they have a positive attitude towards? Mm -hmm. And if they don't have that already, if they need that mm. by the time they graduate our course, how can we then ensure that we build that into the mm -hmm. course as an integrated part of our training to train these attitudinal behaviors? At the Chaos Pilots, mm -hmm. um, we also work with a concept called the hidden curriculum. Okay. So there are some things that's, that are obvious, that are stated in lessons, plans, and goals with, mm -hmm. with what we do, but there are also these hidden elements. And a lot of times the way we work with the mindset of the students and, and set the frames for understanding, collaboration, mm. and leadership also mm. comes from that, this hidden curriculum. of, mm -hmm. um, And a part of that is building a team. Mm -hmm. and being a team together where you are also not just responsible for yourself and your own learning but you become co-responsible for the learning space mm -hmm. and learning of yourself and learning of others because suddenly you're not just a receiver mm -hmm. of information but suddenly you are also a part of a system where learning takes place uh, mm -hmm. and you support others in that and that means peer-to-peer uh, -peer sparing and learning etc that sounds really uh, interesting and very uh, holistic and comprehensive as well. And I think your idea of starting from the why of the program yes. and keeping that at the core is, I think, really critical.
Yeah. And uh, just to sort of recap some of the other aspects that you spoke about, and then you said that it's important to sort of keep the profile of the learner in mind that yes. who is it that we are designing for, mm. and therefore what's the experience that we are wanting to create. And uh, then moving on to not just focusing on the knowledge piece, but even the skills and attitudes. And I think what you spoke about uh, building the skills and attitudes towards learning to learn mm. is very critical in today's day and age as we are sort of moving into a world which is going to be more and more uncertain. Exactly. And we are going to be constantly adapting to the changing uh, reality so that it becomes even more important. Yep. Um, and I think what I also liked uh, about what you were talking about that how it's not just about the self, but the self in the context of say the learning community, self in the context of the larger society and uh, self even in the context of say from a career mindset the industry sort of aspect coming in that people are sort of going to be moving into these spaces and then how are we preparing them for that. So. Yeah because what you see in the field uh, of traditional academia is that uh, some people when they graduate they experience like a gap, they can mm -hmm. find the right job that match what uh, like the skills they have and um, what they really want to do mm -hmm. and how to f uh, close that gap so they actually can see that what they've learned in, the f in, yeah. in their education can actually be applied into the world whether that's in an NGO or an organization or a, a corporate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also their passion in terms of what they really want to do and can be good at. So yeah, because there's a also a, there's a shift in mindset. Like the new generations don't just want to come and, yeah. and do work. They also want an autonomous workplace. And that's the thing that in a lot of, of uh, educational spaces, we don't create that trustful uh, frame where there's space to be autonomous, to take risks mm -hmm. and to allow to allow failure and where you feel safe and you are, you're ready to yeah, explore and experiment yeah. that are part of the values from the chaos pilots. So one question that I have for you, David, and this is something you spoke about in your earlier response also while talking about how there are different kinds of learners who come with different needs uh, to a learning program. So as a trainer or a facilitator or an education designer, uh, how do I sort of, you know, cater to these different needs and learning styles? And, and I sometimes wonder that is it even possible to be able to cater to every learner's need in a single sort of learning experience that we are creating? Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, so I would say it's all about engagement and sure. figuring out that when we sit in the design process before mm -hmm. we actually deliver our program or teaching, mm -hmm. uh, we wonder like how can we make sure if they're on certain levels and if mm -hmm. they've heard this before, if they, if they don't know, yeah. then it's hard to f find that level of uh, what should you do. Yeah. But if you design your process based on activating all uh, students and creating this space mm -hmm. um, where everyone is activated, mm -hmm. uh, then you also create a sense of co-ownership of this learning space mm -hmm. so suddenly it's not you as the teacher that has to like take care of and mm -hmm. make sure that everybody learns and gets this mm -hmm. but you're suddenly also uh, somehow requesting and demanding that the students also become active in their own learning process mm -hmm. so you are you're activating them in uh, asking them questions where they have to uh, reflect both individually, maybe in, in, in groups mm -hmm. or in the uh, pl plenary session. So, uh, and also ask them like, what do they know already? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what level are they at? Mm -hmm. And if you create this environment where there's, there's a space to say, like map out what do they know, what don't they know, where, mm -hmm. where does their interest lie? Um, mm -hmm. Then you suddenly uh, create a space where you can also do uneven uh, learning acceleration. Mm -hmm. So that means you don't have to stand with the board mm -hmm. and teach everybody the same mm -hmm. things, but sure. suddenly you can uh, divide people in groups and they can choose themselves uh, based on passion and interest. And if the, there will be like a, s a certain uh, uh, levels that mm -hmm. are uneven, then they can support each other. Because suddenly mm -hmm. if you build a community of practice mm -hmm. where we are a learning community, it's not just about me getting mm -hmm. my learning, but it's also about uh, ensuring that the rest of my class or teammates will learn. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's okay to be a, a peer, uh, peer-to-peer uh, mm -hmm. learning setting. Mm -hmm. So I can also uh, mm -hmm. learn others' mm -hmm. uh, elements. So if I have previous experience that you might not have, mm. I mean, we can, we can uh, benefit from that in a setting. And then we might need your uh, curious question that I might find 
obvious mm -hmm. because you go back to basics. But sometimes challenging these things can also help us moving mm -hmm. on and you might have other experiences or see other things. So this is the, like, the concept of embracing diversity, mm -hmm. both in backgrounds and experiences, but also in skill uh, levels or mm -hmm. knowledge uh, uh, levels, mm -hmm. and, and create a frame where that's okay and acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, so you spoke about the idea of activating the learners. What I'm taking away from what you said is that it's one, being able to sort of create more choice-based pathways for the learner. Uh, so that uh, maybe they can come with their inquiry that can guide the entire learning process. Um, and the second piece here that you spoke about was sort of creating this learning community which uh, can sort of support, where the learners can sort of support each other and, and we can bring in the diversity, say whether it's in terms of knowledge, skills or attitudes, where they can then be learning from each other. Uh, is there anything more to this idea of activating the learner? So I think it's about creating that space for at autonomy. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. so if you if you set an environment where mm -hmm. people feel that mm -hmm. they can trust the learning space, so that's also about getting you out of the way, mm -hmm. because suddenly if you stand there as the teacher, as the authority that okay. can say right or wrong, mm -hmm. then suddenly you don't have a, an environment where people feel that they can trust that mm -hmm. they, their ideas are not seen as being mm -hmm. stupid or wrong and they want to like they want to have the correct answer mm -hmm. so creating that environment meaning simply also changing the setting of the whole uh, teaching space mm -hmm. uh, that is not just line of chairs and tables mm -hmm. and you standing up there at the board but what if you all get in the same eye level like creating a, mm -hmm. a circle or uh, working at group tables mm -hmm. and Creating tasks where there's no like, it's not about finding the right answer, but it's about finding your pathway. Mm -hmm. So it's simply also the way we design the tasks mm -hmm. that is not about like uh, looking for the check marks and mm -hmm. getting it right, but saying how could we also create a space where there are several pathways to go that can activate this sense of autonomy, mm -hmm. where me as a learner can mm -hmm. actually uh, have take initiative mm -hmm. to use my previous experience and activate my creativity mm -hmm. and my own thoughts of how elements can be brought together and how we could solve this uh, mm -hmm. challenge or work with this opportunity. And um, suddenly there becomes, a, you, you create a whole other environment mm -hmm. uh, where it's not about what is like skill level one, two, three. It's not progressive in the same way because you understand learning uh, as a more like complex system mm -hmm. uh, and that there's a process and a social system where we are learning with each other, from each other. And it's not just about like um, suddenly you reach this level and then you are, then you are You're wise, yeah. but we all hold different uh, experiences and ideas about about the world and if we create a space where all these are allowed mm -hmm. we can suddenly do much more together so mm -hmm. it's also if you believe in like the potential in the individual learner and then truly design mm -hmm. and uh, deliver your learning spaces based on this belief in the individual I think that's a really powerful thing to say that having this belief in the potential of the learner yeah. which is also making me then think about how in the design process we also need to then think through maybe the role of the facilitator themselves and how that also needs to be thought through and designed in a certain way in terms of the knowledge, skills and attitude the facilitator is bringing to the process. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything to say about that? So, um, I acknowledge that it's a challenge for a lot of people working with the field of education or training within organizations to mm -hmm. actually step back. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people that really want to do that, mm -hmm. but then being there on the floor, in the classroom, or mm -hmm. with the team, a group of people, actually daring mm -hmm. to step back from the content level. Mm -hmm. Because you know so much, and if you're a leader in an organization, you have so much experience and you have many ideas, mm -hmm but actually consciously taking a step back and not bringing them out, mm -hmm. but just being there as a neutral facilitator that dares to ask questions and also dares to ask the simple questions mm -hmm. and dares to challenge mm -hmm. the group and the learner mm -hmm. and let them come with the answer. Mm -hmm. And don't intervene to too fast. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they need, sometimes they need time, they need to find their way mm -hmm. and they might not do it in the way that you imagined they had to do it. Mm -hmm. But here's the potential. If you perceive yourself as a, as a teacher, as a facilitator, as a leader, 
as a learner yourself, mm -hmm. then suddenly you can also learn from your students, mm -hmm. from your employees mm -hmm. in this process. Yeah. And I think with stepping back, we got a good example in the masterclass of how you would actually just sort of frame the process for the group to then take it forward and then step back and let them sort of do it at their own pace and uh, figure it out in the group. So that was a really sort of uh, good experience of how this can actually be put into practice. Yeah, and that there's also something of trusting the learner mm -hmm. and empowering the learner mm -hmm. by giving that trust, even though you haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. oh, because it's also a process of slowly activating that potential. Because a lot of learners find themselves in a space where they don't believe in themselves. So uh, how do you activate this confidence mm -hmm. in the individual learner? And that's a process that takes time. So you can't just from day one go in and shift and mm -hmm. see that, that the learners will, will grow. So you need to give them relevant tasks and you need to give them that space to grow and feel this confidence mm -hmm. that they also have ideas and experience to bring in. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point you make about keeping it as a gradual and evolving process where you're sort of increasing the complexity as yes, you're moving exactly. forward and also setting maybe a foundation for the learner to then take it up and uh, sort of be able to deliver on it and feel confident about themselves. Yeah. Which actually brings me to my next sort of question, which is around that many times as, uh, as designers, we are able to put a frame, like the vision backcasting framework that you were talking about. So we'll be clear about the vision, we know what are the outcomes we're expecting, we know who our learner is. But then how do we translate that thought process from a framework to actual delivery mm. and designing the actual sort of content and experience of the program. Yeah. Before I said you like mm -hmm. perceive yourself not just as a teacher or deliverer of content, but yeah. also a facilitator of learning spaces. Yeah. And I think um, the second element to that is also to see yourself as a method designer mm -hmm. and as a hacker Okay. Uh, and as a prototyper. Meaning that in order to make a change in mm -hmm. the way you deliver learning spaces, mm -hmm. you also need to experiment yourself and try out new things. Mm. And you can't just get it right from the first time you do mm. it. Mm. So also begin to this work with the concept of prototyping. Mm. So trying some things out and, and then getting the feedback from, from the group or from your peers to see how, how does the group respond to that mm. and how can I develop that further. So daring to experiment with your own practice um, and then I believe we've all been exposed to different ways of teaching or facilitation or leadership. Mm -hmm. And then taking the elements that you like and think, hey, this might make sense mm -hmm. in the setting that mm -hmm. I'm at. And then trying to adapt that and have the, uh, I sometimes call it profit, uh, like, uh, process confidence, the confidence that you can actually create those processes yourself and that you can hack mm -hmm. the different elements into a setting that makes sense in this specific context. Mm -hmm. and then take methods from everything are like are we indoors are we outdoors do people have to sit and just think with a question on their own do they have to produce things mm -hmm. do they have to work with uh, materials are you working on your own or in groups or mm -hmm. two by two uh, are you in a plenary session like mm -hmm. what is the task and how can we create a diversity in the way we activate uh, people and work with these elements and play around with them mm -hmm. and then when you see methods used in digital spaces or offline spaces how can you be inspired by them and adapt them mm -hmm. to the setting you're having so and somehow also creating the pedagogy that matches the content you have to deliver and the group of people you're working with mm -hmm. okay. so basically uh, being able to sort of uh, one also being open to experiment ourselves but then that also makes me think about that when we are in a learning process we are actually working with individuals yeah and how much of a leeway do we have to experiment what if it goes like drastically wrong and uh, would we then have the space to sort of repair it back because you're working with individuals and it's sort of affecting yeah. their being in a way and so uh, <laughs> I believe that we have done something wrong in the educational system for hundreds of years, That's so true. it might not be that uh, <laughs> dangerous or risky to try to do new things that might accelerate learning massively. Mm -hmm. uh, and we might uh, create some processes that are not perfect. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's fine. We can prototype. Mm -hmm. But if, if we activate the students in that process and also allow for feedback in that process, so that's also something of daring to be vulnerable. 
mm -hmm. and daring not to have the answer as a teacher, facilitator, as a leader of a learning space. And if suddenly we perceive ourselves mm -hmm. in this position, then we won't deliver a whole course that's where nobody learns, mm -hmm. because they will let us know if we create a culture know. of trust where people are active and it's a community of learning where, where they are also responsible and you are also, of course, guiding and leading and creating a space for this learning to take place. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the risk of failing completely there is much lower than failing with a lecture. Mm -hmm. that you might be like, okay, so half the, t uh, the students actually already read a book about those things, so they got might nothing no for more, this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think what, I've ta uh, what I'm taking back again as a critical part of the design process is to then also design for feedback from the learners from time to time yes. and, and being okay putting ourselves in a vulnerable position mm -hmm. if something's not working and being open to acknowledging that and then being willing to change mm. and maybe experiment a little bit more. Yes. And that's the element of not only seeing yourself as the expert, because if you perceive yourself as an expert, you need to know everything. Yeah. If you perceive yourself as a facilitator of learning spaces, then you don't need to know anything. And you can know anything, because learning happens different for every individual. Yeah. So you can't be an expert on their learning process. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that space for, for dialogue and interaction in order to succeed with this. Mm -hmm. And there, there can still be some elements where you are in the role of the expert, where you have some knowledge that you want to give to these, this group of students. But there might also be then the role of the facilitator, where you are not the learning expert mm -hmm. and where they can create things that we haven't seen before. Like, if you want yeah. to create a culture of innovation and a space for innovation to take place, you can set the bar because if the best the students can do is what you already know, mm. like, then we don't dream new things possible. Yeah. So we really want to accelerate yeah. uh, above that. Yeah. Then, then we need to create a space where you are not the, the cleverest person in the room, but you yeah. allow the students yeah. to be that. So what I'm also hearing you say is that we need to design for multiplicity of roles, not just for the facilitator, but even for the learner, where they're sort of interchanging and where the facilitator can be the expert or even the learner can be an expert at certain points and times. Exactly. And um, yeah, all right. Uh, which actually brings me to the last question then, that how do we then measure the success of the program? And how do we design uh, assessment processes in such a way that it's more holistic and not just focused on knowledge and information, but also sort of helps the learners get to know themselves better and also helps them maybe give feedback and get feedback on the learning process itself. Right. So what we see in the educational system is that what we assess on also uh, puts the attention of the learner of what do they need to practice mm -hmm. and learn and get right. Mm -hmm. And if we only put a focus on the skills mm -hmm. or the, the knowledge you have mm -hmm. and uh, putting that into like written exams or multiple choices, then suddenly that's also the focus you get. And we see, we've seen that development and also in PISA tests that we, if we get this narrow focus on math or language proficiency, then it's uh, what takes the attention of the learner. Mm -hmm. And if we want to broaden that, we also need to broaden our assessment criteria. Mm -hmm. And I want to show you um, oh. the assessment model from mm -hmm. uh, the CARES Pilot School. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called the CARES Pilot Competence Model. And it's basically uh, the model consisting mm -hmm. of four competencies that we want all students uh, mm -hmm. at the CARES Pilot to have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what we designed from but it's also what the individual student is, is assessed on at the end of a, a semester or at the end of the three-year program. The first one is subject competence. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes we dig into leadership or entrepreneurship or organizational development. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding on the con content, mm -hmm. uh, we have the, the subject itself. Then there's the action competence. And that means the ability to take your knowledge and apply it Mm -hmm. into a certain uh, context and act on that. Mm -hmm. So getting the skill level of using these um, elements and daring to prototype and to test and to create new things. Mm -hmm. Then there is relationship competence, uh, mm -hmm. which means the ability to create professional relations. So if I work within the field of organizational development mm -hmm. and I set new things in motion, I also need to create a professional network. Mm -hmm. That means to relate to people in an organization, talk to employees, talk to leaders, mm -hmm. 
and it also means building a professional uh, learning community. So not only having a team leader, but also uh, setting like a, a learning group. Mm -hmm. For instance, at the Kerspals, we work with learning groups mm -hmm. where you have uh, peers that support you in your learning process, mm -hmm. but also finding mentors that are relevant to your learning process and taking care of that yourself. Mm -hmm. Change competence relates to the ability to uh, understand that the world is rapidly changing mm -hmm. and we live in a turbulent uh, world where we can predict tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this is also about the attitudinal part of, uh, of your mindset toward the work that you do. Mm -hmm. We can't just apply these things in a linear manner, but we need to understand the complexity of our societies. Mm -hmm. Around all this, there's the fifth uh, competence which is called value and impact. Mm -hmm. So you both work from the foundation and the idea of creating value for other people, for communities, for businesses, for uh, societies, and create a true impact for, mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And you also assessed on your ability to actually create an actual impact. Because you might be really good at uh, acting and creating relations, but well, it doesn't... What is it leading to? What is it leading to, yeah. Mm -hmm. So all these five elements or the way that all exams mm -hmm. are designed from and assessed, assessed uh, on. And we also use it as a self-assessment tool for the individual student and for the, the team to see how they progressed in their own learning journey. Mm -hmm. I think this is a great sort of framework to have because it's sort of also focused on the individual but also on the outside and how they're sort of engaging with the larger ecosystem and ultimately like is it leading yeah. to any yeah. kind of uh, impact. impact yeah. yeah I think yeah this is a great way of sort of looking at and broadening the frame of assessment itself so thank you for sharing this with us thank you and with that I think I have come to the end of the conversation if there are any last sort of tips that you want to give to people who are looking to uh, design a learning process any of your sort of good practices then we'll be It'll be nice to hear that and yeah. Uh, I just think I said with like uh, the last reminder for the people seeing this video is that it might so uh, sound a bit uh, challenging mm -hmm. or like going out of their comfort zone. And I just want to uh, give them back the confidence that uh, this will de demand uh, some new action and some new line of thinking and perceiving your will in another way that you have done previously, mm -hmm. maybe. And uh, so daring to step out of, of that role and experimenting with that because it might not be that mm -hmm. challenging and that uh, hard. And I think you will gain so much from it as an individual, mm -hmm. but your learners and the people you work with on a daily basis will also gain so much from that. So just uh, believing in yourself and finding that confidence that uh, you can actually also learn and develop your way of delivering learning spaces. Great. So believe in yourself, believe yeah. in your learner and it will lead to a great learning experience. Thank yes. you, David. And we hope to have you back in India very soon with another masterclass, maybe. Maybe. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Nia.